The Ford Puma has been around for a few years now and I've just spent a few weeks with this one and I reckon it's still pretty bloody good. Stay tuned and I'll tell you why. G'day, I'm Matt. This channel is called The Right Car. This could be the right small SUV for you if you're looking for one that's fun to drive and still pretty value focused with a bunch of standard kit that you will appreciate. Stay tuned, I'm going to tell you all about it in this review. A few years ago when this little itty bitty Ford SUV launched, I was convinced that $30,000 for the starting point was a little bit high. But these days, I feel like it's about right for the market. Now, the market has shifted quite a bit when it comes to compact SUVs. So the pricing for the Puma is decent when you're considering what you're getting as standard. Now, there are three different grades available. The entry one is just called Puma, and it comes as standard with LED lighting. You get 17-inch alloy wheels. You get an 8-inch touchscreen media system with Sync 3. That's Ford's infotainment system, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, a regular steering wheel, regular dial cluster, and cloth seat trim on the inside. If you step up to this model here, which is the ST line, then you end up with, well, same alloy wheels, 17 inches, but different design. You also get a black look body kit or black elements on the outside, sports suspension, and on the inside you get a 12.3 inch digital instrument cluster for the driver. Different seat trim with some red highlights which do jazz it up a little bit, and I reckon it looks and feels a little bit more special than the base model. It gets a flat bottom steering wheel as well. And then at the top of the range is the ST Line V. Now it has a few extras that you will appreciate, including different interior trim as well, 18 inch alloy wheels, and it looks a bit more special. It's got chrome exterior highlights too. Tell me which one you would pick or if you'd pick something completely different. In fact, speaking of different cars, let's get to my best alternatives to this. There are a few really good alternatives to the Ford Puma, which I would recommend that you have a look at. If you're spending about this kind of money and you want this size of car, then I reckon you should be looking at the Volkswagen T-Cross. A facelifted version is coming in 2024, but the existing one's still pretty good looking and pretty good inside as well. The thing I like about it is that it has a more practical cabin than some of the other small SUVs out there, and it's got a sliding second row seat so you can prioritize passenger or boot space, whatever you need. It's got a turbo engine, it's fun to drive, it's also also relatively well priced too. Another small SUV from the Volkswagen group, the Skoda Kamiq. You can check out my review of that one by hitting the link at the top of the screen there. I reckon that's a great little small SUV with a thrummy three-cylinder turbo petrol engine just like the T-Cross. I like it a lot, although I reckon the four-cylinder version just lives up to that car a little bit better. And if you can spend the extra money, then I recommend you do that. But it's a lovely car to drive. Comes with some really nice standard equipment, including an electric boot and a digital screen for the driver as well. Yeah, pretty nice. And finally, if you are after a little SUV that's still pretty decent on practicality and comes with hybrid powertrain availability, then I reckon you should look at a Toyota Yaris Cross. Hit the link up there and you'll be able to see my review of the Yaris Cross. I drove the GR Sport version, which I don't think is the most convincing Yaris Cross, but there are a bunch of different variants available. 10, I think there was at last count. So yeah, uh, you've got a huge amount of choice there, whether you want petrol or hybrid and all-wheel drive available as well. So that's a nice little thing to have. Tell me which you would pick, or would you pick something different? Comment, let me know. Officially, the Puma is called a light SUV, which means that it's very small. It's less than 4.2 meters long. It's also pretty light, surprisingly enough. And also, it's just sort of the right size for someone who's looking for a small hatchback, but maybe doesn't want a hatchback anymore. Wants a slightly higher ride height. This could be the right car for you if that's you. Although, I have some things to tell you about the back seat space. It could be better. I won't spoil it. We'll get to that in the next bit. But I'll show you the boot now because it's pretty good. Let's have a look. Boot space for the Ford Puma is bigger than you would expect. There's 410 litres of cargo capacity in here, which is big for the class. And there's even a little bit more space underneath the boot floor if you want to hide things away, which is really neat. Now, there's a space saver spare wheel as well, which is good to see. There's not much in the way of netting on the sides to you know, stop your milk bottles from flying around in the boot, but it is a good size and a good shape. And also, you need to know that if you want an electric boot, you can get one on all grades. It's standard on the top spec, but 750 bucks if you want it on one of the lower grade versions. 
I reckon the interior of the Puma looked good when it came out, but it is starting to feel a little bit old these days. A lot of new models have come out since this car arrived, and um, it is starting to feel just like it's needing a bit of a nip and tuck now. So there are some elements to it that I really still like, though. This touchscreen media system on top here, it's very easy to reach when you're driving. There are controls down below, buttons and dials, which I really like. Below there, there's also air conditioning controls. Um, I like that too. A fan dial just makes things a lot easier. Climate control as well. And you'll also see in front of the driver in this spec, you get that big 12.3 inch digital instrument cluster. I reckon that is just a nice little bit of wow factor when you're spending this kind of money. Um, although some other SUVs in this price band do have digital clusters as standard these days. So it isn't necessarily that wow factor, if you get me. I will say though that when it comes to this infotainment screen, you do have a cable connected Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and that's always just a little bit messier than wireless. This car also has an optional panoramic sunroof fitted, which does have a bit of wow factor. My daughter thought that it was really cool that there are two different glass roofs, one up front and one in the back. So that's kind of neat. Okay, so let's talk about materials. The seat trim, I like it, but it is starting to show signs of wear. This car only has, well, less than 10,000 kilometers on it, and it's already a little bit worn out looking. Yes, it's a press car, and press cars do suffer a pretty hard life, but even so, I would have expected maybe a bit better when it comes to the material quality. Now, speaking of which, it does have a lot of the cheaper feeling and looking plastics. Like I said, it doesn't really feel as special as it could, but I do like the fact that you do have soft elbow padding on the center console bin and also on the armrests. This fabric finish up here is also nice and soft when you are on a longer road trip to just rest your arm against something, so that's nice. And the steering wheel, yep, it gets the red stitching as well, so that's kind of cool. Cool. This spec does have manual adjustment for the seats and you can get a pretty good driving position. It's got reach and rake adjustment for the steering wheel as well. So my partner and I, with our big height difference, haven't had any issues when it's come to sharing this car. All right, let's check out the back seat. Righto, so a lot of other small SUVs have more back seat space than this car does. This seat is set for my driving position, um, 182 centimeters or six foot tall. My knees are hard up against it. Um, I don't have that much wiggle room really. Um, I've got a fair bit of foot room, decent-ish headroom. And if I push this little cover back, yeah, you can sort of see that there's not that much space available to me, but it is, I mean, it's okay. I wouldn't say that if you are buying a car that's just for you and your family that this would be the best option for you because there are other cars in this sort of price bracket which have more space available in the back seat if that's a priority for you. And speaking of which, I've had my daughter's child seat fitted in here. It's a forward facing seat. I don't think that a rearward facing capsule would be a very good fit for this car. Um, it just doesn't quite have the amount of space that some other vehicles have. But there are ISO fix points in the window seats and three top tether points as well. When it comes to amenities back here, there's not a whole lot going on. Got a couple of mesh map pockets, a couple of bottle holders in the doors, a little small storage storage section here, but no directional air vents. There's no fold down armrests, no cup holders, anything like that. So it is pretty basic. And again, the seat fabric and material just looks like it's wearing out already. And I'm not a huge fan of that. All versions of the Ford Puma sold in Australia at this point in time come with a one litre three cylinder turbo petrol engine and you'll see the outputs on your screen now. They are pretty perky for a little tiny three pot turbo engine. Now it's backed by a seven speed dual clutch automatic transmission and it's front wheel drive. We miss out on the really fast versions that they get in Europe, which is a shame, but I reckon this one's a pretty good engine anyway. I'll tell you more now. I like it. I like the way the Ford Puma drives. I like it a lot. It's so much more enjoyable than some of the other small SUVs at this kind of price point. Um, it's just really nice to drive. It's got a real natural feel to it. It's also quite fun. A lot of that comes down to the fact that this one is the ST line version. It gets the sportier suspension. Yep, it's a bit firmer. So if you don't like firm suspension, one of the other versions might be better for you. But I like the way that it handles. It's got really nice steering as well. And it also kind of reminded me when I got back into this car, um, it's kind of like a Mini Cooper to drive in a lot of ways, just a bit more refined bit less crashy and crunchy over bumpy sections of road, which is nice to see. So 
if you like driving and you want a small SUV, this could be a really good choice for you. It's also got a really zesty, enjoyable one litre turbo petrol engine, which has heaps of grunt. For such a small engine in a little car, um, it's punchy. It's got plenty of poke and it does respond pretty quickly, although there is a bit of lag to contend with when the car's cold. Just keep that in mind. The transmission is a seven speed dual clutch and look, it's one of the better examples, but it's not the best. Um, it's got a bit of a tendency to feel a bit lurchy at lower speeds, especially when it's cold, when the car's cold. Um, but at higher speeds, when you're driving a bit more enthusiastically, it's a pretty clever transmission, picks the right gear most of the time when it should and I haven't really had any issues with it. My partner drove this car quite a bit as well. She had no problem with it whatsoever. She thought it was pretty fun to drive too. Look, there are some issues with it. Um, it's not the most refined, and uh, like I mentioned, this one has the sporty suspension, so it's not the cushiest car to drive. It's also not the quietest. Um, it has quite a bit of road roar to contend with, especially if you are going on course chip roads at higher speeds. You'll notice it can be pretty loud in here. I guess that's just an excuse to turn up the stereo or maybe buy a different car. Sort of depends what your priorities are. I don't mind that you can hear the three cylinder turbo petrol engine rumbling away in the background either. And I like turbo petrol three cylinder engines. So yeah, this is a pretty joyful little powertrain. Yeah, I really like the Ford Puma. I've enjoyed spending time with it. And if you like driving, I reckon you'll like it too. All right, let's talk efficiency. So. All versions of the Puma, as I said, come with the same one litre turbo three cylinder petrol powertrain. And that means they all have the same official combined cycle fuel consumption figure of 5.3 litres per 100 Ks. That's what you should be able to achieve across a mix of different driving scenarios. I've done a mix of driving in this car over four or five weeks, thanks to Ford for lending it to me for a slightly longer loan. And you'll see on screen what I saw, uh, a little bit over the claim, but I reckon that's still okay. Sure, it's not hybrid-like fuel consumption, but it's gonna be good enough for most people, I reckon. The Ford Puma achieved the maximum five-star ANCAP safety rating in 2019. That's a little bit old, but it still has a bunch of standard safety tech, including autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. There's a lane keeping system and also a reversing camera, rear parking sensors and cruise control. Now, if you spend $990 and option the park pack, you end up with a bunch of extra safety technology that you really should be getting as standard in my opinion, including blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert, adaptive cruise control, an active lane keeping system, an auto parking system, and front parking sensors. All that for less than a grand? I don't know why Ford just doesn't add it as standard across the range. It'd be doing a favor to its consumers if it did so. Just bump up the price, who cares? Anyway, it's got six airbags, dual front, front side, and full length curtain. That's okay, but not setting any new standards. In Australia, Ford offers a five-year unlimited kilometre warranty, which is behind the likes of MG, GWM Havel, Sangyong, Kia, and now Skoda as well. They all have seven-year warranty plans. Now, there's a cap price servicing plan available for the Puma, and the first four services are $329. Now, that's for the first 60,000 kilometers or four years. So as you can guess, the intervals are 12 months and 15,000 Ks. There's roadside assist available as well. It's been really nice to get reacquainted with the Ford Puma after, well, it's been a few years since I last drove one. So it's still a very good little SUV and I reckon it's gonna be the right car for a bunch of people for a bunch of reasons, although interior trim quality could be better. And as a result, I reckon maybe the ST Line V might be a better choice for most people who know they're gonna be a little bit hard on their car's interior. Tell me what you reckon in the comments section below. Would you choose it? Would you choose one of its rivals? And if you already own a Puma, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Tell me what it's like to live with. All right, see you in the next one. Please do like and subscribe if you haven't already. Bye.